Hello, and thank you for joining us for this study entitled Intimate Conversations with Jesus from the Gospel of John. My name is Derek Williams. I'm the Associate Minister for the Great Oaks Church of Christ in Bartlett, Tennessee. This is part two of a lesson entitled, I Once Was Blind, and it's an examination of the account of Jesus healing a man who was unable to see from birth. Now, so far in the series, we've examined how Jesus talked to rich people about salvation in his conversation with Nicodemus. We've also witnessed how the Lord talked to poor people about salvation in his conversation with a woman at the well. And in this chapter, we're learning how Jesus talked to people who were disabled about salvation when the Lord healed this man who had been unable to see from birth. Now, in our last lesson, we examined the cause of blindness. Let's read the first five verses of John chapter 9 to review. As he, that is Jesus, went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You know, when tragedy occurs, we want to know why bad things happen and who is to blame. Those are the questions the disciples raise in this case as well. Why did this happen and who was to blame? The Jews believed that all suffering was the result of sin. And this truth was revealed in the questions asked by the disciples. They didn't ask Jesus if sin caused the blindness. But rather, they simply were curious about whose sin caused this blindness. When well, answer the disciples' question, Jesus said in verse 3, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. But why do bad things sometimes happen to good people? Why does the Lord allow us to face tragedy when we haven't sinned? But Jesus answered, it happens for the work of the Lord to be displayed in our lives in the way that we respond to trouble. But now, let's see the work of God revealed in this man's life by examining the cure for blindness. Pick up now in verse 6. Having said this, Jesus spit on the ground. He made some mud with saliva. And he put it in the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went, washed, and he came home seeing. Now I've got a Bible question for you. How many people were healed of blindness in the Old Testament? How many people had ever been healed of blind, blindness until this miracle in John chapter 9? Well, if you said none, then you're correct. People had been raised from the dead. Lepers had been cleansed. And yet no one had ever been healed of blindness prior to this encounter with Jesus in John chapter 9. Now, people who lived in the darkness of blindness had no hope until the one who is the light of the world came to heal us. And notice the method Jesus used to heal this man. He, he spat on the ground and he made some mud. He used a, a saliva mixture to put on the man's eyes. But why did Jesus spit, mix, and then tell this man to get going to the pool of Siloam? Well, people believed in that day that spit had medicinal value in the first century. They believed that saliva from certain important people, it could cure all kinds of diseases. Well, in the modern world, we're repulsed to hear of such a procedure, but the blind man didn't fuss. In fact, if, if you were blind all your life, I mean, would you mind if someone tried to cure you with some spit and mud. I wouldn't. We still do some strange things today to get healing, don't we? You know, when you have heart trouble, a surgeon will split your chest like a watermelon and rearrange your plumbing to keep your blood flowing. And when you get the dreaded disease of cancer, an oncologist will pump poison called chemotherapy into you 
to try to kill the cancer before the medicine kills you. Well, desperate people are willing to take desperate measures to, to get healing. You know, every human being has the cancer of sin, and it will destroy us. We're all infected by sins such as profanity, greed, lust, jealousy. And if we leave those sins untreated, they will have devastating consequences for us. But please don't think it's too late for you, or there's nothing that can be done to break the power of sin in your life. Say, so do you want to be healed? Then you do what this blind man did. He listened to Jesus, and then he obeyed. The Lord told him to go to the pool of Siloam and wash in verse 6. Jesus is telling people to do the same thing today. Very simple. Get washed. And what will happen to you? The same thing that happened to this blind man in verse 7 when he obeyed. The Bible says, so the man went, he washed, he came home seeing in verse 7. Do you remember the story of Naaman in the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 5? Naaman was a very important man. He was the commander of the army of his entire country. And the Bible says he was a man who was highly regarded. He was also a great soldier. However, his skin condition took the shine off of his greatness because he had the dreaded disease of leprosy. And Naaman owned a, a slave girl that had been captured from Israel in battle. And she previously belonged to the prophet Elisha from Samaria. Well, she sent word to Naaman that her former master could help her, help him with his skin condition. And so he decided to give it a try. When Naaman went to the prophet Elisha, he expected to be treated with a proper protocol because he was an important man. And after all, he was a commander of the, the whole army of his country. He was a man of influence and affluence. However, when Naaman arrived at Elisha's house, there was no welcome committee, there was no parade, and Elisha didn't even trouble himself to get up and come outside the house to greet this great man. Instead, the prophet sent a boy out of the house to meet this military celebrity with a meager message. And this was it. Naaman, go wash in the Jordan River seven times and you will be healed. Well, that treatment just flabbergasted Naaman. I mean, he, he was a prominent person who'd come for help from a lowly preacher who told him basically to go jump in the river. Or 2 Kings 5.11 says, Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Naaman didn't just want a prescription. He wanted some pomp and circumstance. He didn't just want a cure. He wanted ceremony, and he left in a blind rage. Well, fortunately for Naaman, he had a servant with some common sense who said this to him. If the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So Naaman got hold of himself and went down and dipped in the Jordan River seven times just as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. In 2 Kings 5, verses 13 and 14. You know, while Naaman was questioning God, there was no healing. However, when he was willing to obey his God, that's when Naaman found the healing that he desperately needed. You see, it's just not enough to have manners and morals and money like Naaman. You can't just be starched and ironed. You must be washed clean like Naaman and just like this blind man at the pool of Siloam. We all need the same healing that only comes from the touch of Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the people who killed the Lord Jesus were given the remedy for their cure for sin as well. Peter plainly told them in Acts 2, 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. Notice Peter did not tell them to be good citizens. He didn't say become a philanthropist. No, he told them to obey God by changing their lives and then be washed to have their sins removed. You know, in the last verse of Acts chapter 2, it says that God added to the church those who were being saved. 
So you don't get healing by giving gifts or by even being good. You were saved by God through obedience to His Word. Jesus sent this blind man to the pool of Siloam. He left immediately. Now, can you imagine that man trying to balance those mud packs on his eyes that Jesus had applied? That would be a tricky measure for a man who could not see. And when he got to the pool, he had to walk down 44 steps to reach the water and then wash. And yet Jesus sent, the man went, and the Bible says he came home seeing. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? The Lord can't make the steps to spiritual sight any simpler. Jesus sends those who want to see spiritually to the waters of baptism. He said in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. So people who go and they're washed, they go home seeing 2020. Now, wouldn't you like to be able to say, I once was blind, but now I see. Why would God allow a man to be born blind and be that way his whole life? God allowed the disability so that when he truly obeyed, he could see eternity. God wants you to have that same vision. God wants you to see that he can take your troubles and then turn them into glory for himself. This is the work of God in this world. He wants to see you changed into one of his children who works for him because you've seen the light just as Jesus taught in John chapter 9, verses 3 through 5. Linda Burdish literally gave herself away. Linda was an outstanding teacher who felt as if she had the time, she would create you know, great art and poetry. When she was 28, however, she began to get severe headaches and sadly, her doctor discovered that she had a massive brain tumor. They told her her chances of surviving an operation were about 2%. Therefore, rather than operating immediately, they chose to wait for six months. She knew she had great artistry in it. So during those six months, she wrote and she drew feverishly. Nearly all of her poetry and her art became famous. At the end of the six months, she had the operation. The night before the surgery, she decided to literally give herself away. In the case of her death, she wrote a will in which she donated all of her body parts to those who needed them more than she would. But unfortunately, Linda's operation was fatal. Subsequently, her eyes went to an eye bank in Bethesda, Maryland, and from there to a recipient in the state of South Carolina. Well, a young man who was 28 went from darkness to sight when he received Linda's eyes. Well, that young man was profoundly grateful. And so he wrote to the eye bank, thanking them for their help. And furthermore, he wanted to thank the parents of the donor. They must indeed be magnificent folks to have a child who would give away her eyes. Well, he was given the name of the British family, and he went to see them. After the initial introduction, Mrs. British reached out, and she embraced him, and she said, Young man, if you've got nowhere to go, my husband and I would love for you to just spend the night with us. Well, he stayed. And as he was looking around Linda's room, he saw that she had read Plato. He had read Plato, but in Braille for the blind. She had read Hegel. Well, he also read Hegel, but in Braille. Well, the next morning, Mrs. Burtis was looking at him and she said, You know, I'm sure I have seen you somewhere before but I don't know where. Suddenly, she remembered. She ran upstairs. She pulled out the last picture that Linda had ever drawn. It was a portrait of her ideal man. The portrait was virtually identical to the young man who had received Linda's eyes. Well, then her mother read that last poem that Linda had written on her deathbed, and it read, Two hearts passing in the night, falling in love, never able to gain each other's sight. Linda gave her life so that someone else might see. And when she gave it all, she produced her dream. If she hadn't given it her all, her family would have never met her ideal man. 
Now, friends, Jesus gave his life so that you might see. And if Jesus hadn't given you the sacrifice of his life, you would have walked in darkness forever. And if Jesus had not given us his all and all, we would have never had the blessing of being welcomed into God's family, the church. In the Garden of Eden, God created the ideal man. He walked with God in his perfect light. But when Adam sinned, man's heart became darkened. And the light of God went out of him. From that moment, all men, women, boys, and girls stumbled in the darkness. But it was not until Jesus came that the light of the world was able to open our lives and illuminate our world. You know, if you've never had your eyes washed, you'll never see. Why don't you come to God's family? And let Jesus heal your blindness and let him light up your darkness. You may be struggling with alcohol or adultery or anger, divorce, discouragement, disillusionment. And you don't know where to turn. Jesus is the only answer to your problems. Say, do you want relief like this blind man got? Then you must do what the blind man did. He obeyed Jesus. He went, washed was healed, and went home seeing. You can be healed today by being washed clean, and you'll be able to say eternally, I once was lost, but now I'm found. If you'd like more information about spiritual sight, please contact us at the Great Oaks Church of Christ. We have a brand new, wonderful website that has all of our contact information, or you can visit us at 3355 Brunswick Road, Bartlett, Tennessee. We would love to see you. I'd love to meet you in person. And thanks again for joining us for these intimate conversations with Jesus from the Gospel of John.